Hi, I'm Nami Baral. I'm the founder and CEO of Harvest Platform, and you are listening to the Rise Fintech Podcast brought to you by Barclays. Hello, and welcome to the first Rise Fintech Podcast from New York. I'm your host, Kester Keating. Rise is a global community of entrepreneurs and innovators curious about what's new in tech and what it means for the future of financial services. In this podcast, we meet startups based at our physical Rise site, although remote right now and industry experts to understand from them what they're doing and what this means for the future of banking straight from the mouths of the people building businesses in this exciting space. This episode of the Rise Fintech podcast features Nami Brab, the founder of Harvest. I'm going to cover off a few items. Um, specifically, I want to talk to Nami more around financial wellness and then how she and her team are reacting to the COVID crisis and as well, of course, as some general tips around um, entrepreneurship and being an entrepreneur and a founder in the fintech space. Thanks for listening and enjoy the conversation. Hey, Nami, so great to have you on the podcast today. Um, we've got um, we've got quite a lot to get through here. I, um, I'm going to turn it over to you, maybe to give just a little bit more of a brief background around um, what your background is, and then, of course, um, you know what you've been up to recently. We're going to dive in a little deeper to the more specifics of the, the COVID crisis. But maybe if you can um, give some of that background and then also for our audience, just give an overview at a high level as, um, as to what your startup Harvest does. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me um, here, Kester. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Um, so for everybody listening, I'm Nami. I'm the founder and CEO of Harvest Platform. Um, Harvest Platform is a fintech startup based here in New York, you know, that is built on the premise and the mission of reducing the debt burden for Americans that are living paycheck to paycheck. We have built a proprietary um, artificial intelligence engine that is able to automatically negotiate your fees and get you reduced rates for your financial products, ranging from bank fees, credit card charges, mortgages, student loans, and more. We also have a proprietary credit worthiness um, scoring system that we have built through our machine learning models that can help you get a true measure of your financial credit worthiness as well. Um, in terms of our team, we are, uh, we are a 10, 9% um, team based here in New York. And uh, we have raised multiple rounds of uh, funding of which, you know, uh, kindly, Barclays uh, is one of them. And it's always a pleasure to be uh, speaking within the Barclays ecosystem and sharing our insights. No, thanks, Nami. And it was, um, you know, really great that we were able to deploy capital and, and invest in Harvest, um, you know, coming out, of, uh, coming out of the program. We obviously, as a firm, you know, really like to um, you know, lean in with an, you know, additional investment dollars for, um, you know, where we think there's a great opportunity and, and a great founder. So really pleased with that, um, you know, that partnership and investment. As a bit of a follow-up question, just in terms of you know, what you do and your um, the offering that Harvest has to, um, to to their customers and clients, can you talk about whether you have a specific client uh, in in mind? I know those negotiating those credit card fees is definitely an issue for uh, Americans from with, from kind of from every background. But I think on the financial wellness piece, it's interesting to get your view on um, was there a specific kind of target market or individual you wanted to go after. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And um, that's a great point that you just brought up. Um, you know, our target market is uh, the typical American, uh, the average American. And when I speak of average American, you don't think of people living paycheck to paycheck, but that is exactly the kind of target market that we are uh, serving to and catering to, right? The average American lives paycheck to paycheck does not even have $400 in the case of an emergency, but really suffers from a massive amount of debt in their lives. The stats show somewhere around like $38,000 of average household debt, and that does not even include mortgages. Now, think of somebody who is literally living from one paycheck to another, does not even have $400 of savings, but now is faced with you know paying this crazy amount of debt. That is obviously one of the most difficult things for anyone, right? And uh, for uh, the typical American that we are, uh, you know, serving, this amount of debt is can be pretty crippling. And so that has been built into, you know, essentially uh, our entire mission of helping that set of customers really achieve financial wellness and really give them a path to prosperity because that's the path that they don't see currently today. Absolutely. And I think that's actually, I'm going to speak maybe kind of a little briefly to 
my uh, my rationale for, for doing the investment, that early stage investment in you know in yourself and the company. And I think the idea of of really um, of really tackling that problem, that issue around uh, indebted levels, obviously, as, as Barclays we have, we do lots of lending, both um, certainly in the U.S. market as well as other markets around the world. And so, if there's a way we can you know, we can help our customers get um, get a better handle on those on those debt payments, make sure they retain that financial wellness. That's um, that's definitely an objective for us as well in terms of you know, doing business in a responsible manner. Yeah. Can you can you talk a little bit more about uh, your inspiration for for founding the startup? Was there um, was there a specific uh, sort of incident or idea that that you had that really uh, catalyzed the, the creation and the founding of the company? Absolutely. Um, so prior to creating Harvest, I um, I was uh, an executive at Twitter for many years. I was actually building real time negotiation products, but for the ad side of the Twitter business. And, uh, you know, uh, I got out of Twitter to start my own company. I knew it was going to be in fintech, but the initial idea was completely different from what we have today. But while testing out that initial idea, what I got the chance to do was to really speak and uh, understand closely the finances of many Americans all over the country, right? Like from Alabama to San Francisco, from Oklahoma to New York, everywhere where you, when you try and listen to what is it really that the typical American needs, uh, at that time, my thesis was completely different, but when I got the chance to look closely at people's finances, I realized that, uh, you know, the bigger problem that they're facing is not really around, oh my God, I'm not saving, I'm not investing. That is still a problem, but most of the times people are not even able to get to that point of thinking about saving and investing. Right. Like when you have so much debt in your life and when you are thinking about, OK, you know, I need to pay this, this and that bill before the next paycheck. You can imagine you're not thinking about I don't have an investment account, for example. Right. So at that time, I realized that, you know, it was really a big revelation in terms of the product defining product building criteria. It was about the biggest problem that needs solving right now for the average American is is all about their debt profile. How can we reduce this overall, you know, this debt that hangs over their shoulders to, uh, you know, really put them in a path to, uh, you know, prosperity and give them some sort of hope in life, right? So it really became a defining factor of, you know, my product building journey. And we decided to pivot away from the idea of building, you know, the initial product that we were thinking about, which was an investment platform and focus more towards building this platform to reduce the overall debt burden. Because once we tackle this reduction of debt and move people to more productive forms of credit, then, you know, obviously there are many, many opportunities to uh, provide the, you know, bigger, brighter, uh, nicer uh, things in financial products, which are savings accounts, investment accounts, and more. But we need to uh, tackle the darker side of people's finances first, which is debt. And that's how the inspiration behind the current phase of uh, Harvest really started. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. I think it's when you kind of talk about it as, you know, the term ecosystem is overused a lot, but maybe if you almost think about it as a, the life cycle or the journey of a, of, of a consumer or in, an individual, and it's, okay, at one end you can have, there's a whole load of fintechs now catering to those investment products that, um, you mentioned i mean i even have some of those in my uh, my portfolio companies as well but you know, often making trades on, on robin hood in general that's um okay it's democratized it and it's opened it up but that's probably not something if someone is in a, a challenge situation with, with debt or they're constantly getting um, hit with these uh, you know additional late fees you don't want to be you know running that alongside trading options um it, it's going to be a challenging one to, to kind of square to square that yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, uh, I think of this in simple math terms. If you look at, you know, if you want to get somebody from zero to 100, you have to get them from negative 100 to zero first. Savings, investing, all kinds of other glamorous financial products are still great and people need to be in the habit of doing those. But at the same time, you need to tackle the larger problem that you are facing in your financial life, which is around debt. Until and unless you exercise some discipline and reduce that overall debt burden, you're not really going to be able to move to more productive forms of credit, right? This is a very, very credit-driven country, and credit used to be 
uh, something that was used for productive means. But right now, it is not productive at all. It is just extremely stressful when you are deeply, deeply drowning in debt. So it's a part of our mission to make sure that we bring you above water and we get you to more productive forms of credit that can actually be helpful in your financial life. Yeah, again, I mean, I think that, that makes a ton of sense. And I think you've actually, you've kind of covered off um, the next question I was going to ask, uh, ask which was around why, why the work you do is so important. And I think actually you've, you've really kind of hit that with the last couple of questions. So I'm going to actually move on. We're, um, you know, we're recording this in uh, mid, mid-May, and so obviously we're in the thick of the, the COVID crisis. And I want to ask you, you see a lot of um, consumer behavior, you have um, a lot of integrations, uh, you know, again, on like an anonymized basis with your, um, you can see transaction flows. Can you talk a little bit to um, what you've seen in terms of the, the COVID impact on American consumers? I mean, uh, it has really changed the way of life in many ways um, for all of us in, uh, you know, that are living here from the way we do groceries to, uh, you know, the way we watch movies, everything. But uh, we obviously, as a, as a company, have a very, very good vantage point into consumers' finances and, uh, you know, what's happening from a bank account or a credit card or a liability perspective. So um, I think it would be, you know, just good to highlight, like, three specific things. Um, so one of the things that we have noticed is uh, now American consumers are paying more in account maintenance fees because they're not able to hold on to the minimum balance requirements their banks have. So banks have obviously been charging those kind of fees more regularly since uh, you know account balances have depleted uh, drastically in these past couple of months. Um, the second thing that we are seeing is actually around um, excess fees. So excess fees are charged whenever you withdraw um, money from your savings account uh, for more than a certain times every month. And uh, obviously because more people are drawing from their savings accounts uh, currently, because inflows obviously have reduced on their checking accounts, they are getting charged more in excess fees. Now, it has been very interesting to see that regulators have actually moved extremely quickly to make sure that excess fees are not charged on customers and the, uh, and the typical limits that are imposed on withdrawals from savings accounts have been lifted. That said, banks are still struggling to implement all of those in real time. So it, uh, there has been this very interesting gap that you see between regulators' action versus banks' you know, adapting to those actions right now. And as part of that, customers are still being hit with excess fees, um, more, much more so than before. And then the third and probably the most important thing here um, that we have seen is right now it's such a black swan event, right? This event came out of nowhere. In these kinds of times, the traditional credit worthiness model really fails the average customer. So, you know, when you have lost your job or you have to be delayed on your payments uh, for your credit cards or your mortgages or your auto loans uh, because you do not have a good source of income right now or you cannot go to work because of the lockdown, uh, you are, uh, you know, you're experiencing these impacts due to no fault of your own, right? So, uh, you know, despite, you know, every customer trying very, very hard to, uh, to make sure that their finances are in order, this macroeconomic crisis has obviously impacted them. And the, the problem of, of this crisis lingers much beyond these couple of months because it affects their credit scores and credit scoring models are not able to handle these kind of weird events. So a big component of this is we have seen these kinds of things happen and it has accelerated a lot of uh, our product roadmap as well as a response to the kinds of things that we're seeing among our customer base. Yeah, I think that that makes a ton of sense. I mean, maybe one um, one follow up question here is just when you look at the behavior of the of the large banks again, of, of which Barclays is obviously you know obviously one uh, in the in the US and specifically in, in the consumer market. Are you seeing? Um, I mean, I think maybe one thing I've noticed. Maybe see if you agree with me. One thing I've noticed, kind of this time around, as it were, as compared to the sort of financial crash back in two thousand and eight, is that in general, and again, it's a gen- general rule. I've seen the the large banks have, have broadly speaking tried to be accommodating to the needs of their consumers in this um, in this challenging time. 
Is that something when you you mentioned quite a lot around the uh, in the kind of the second part of your answer around the different fees that have been charged? It sounds like those fees are still being charged, but potentially are the banks are open to either negotiating them, paying them over time, or possibly even even waiving them in some circumstances. Is that um? Do you see that as well from uh, from your vantage point? Yes, absolutely. So um, you know, I think banks are trying their absolute best. Right, uh, they are trying to be very, very accommodative to customers. They definitely have empathy for the customers during this very hard time. I think the reason you know many of these fees continue to be charged, or uh, you know that customers are not able to get the help they need, is because many banks are still struggling to you know adapt to these measures in terms of implementation. So banks are definitely trying to waive more fees for customers. They are definitely more. Um, you know, more empathetic to people who are laid on credit card payments or, you know, other kinds of payments that they are, uh, that they're responsible to the bank for. But at the same time, it only helps if the customer can get through to the bank. But banks themselves are, you know, essentially struggling with remote work and trying to set up their customer service teams for success because, you know, this is once again a new normal and uh, there are a lot of different kinds of measures the bank has to put in place in order to serve the customers to make sure that there is utmost security and privacy of the customer's data in remote circumstances. So while the intent to help the customers is there, the processes have not adapted at the same pace. So that's why I think we continue to see these fees, but uh, I'm definitely hopeful and I definitely see this uh, in the data from banks itself as um, when banks do get to the customer, when customers are able to get through to the bank, they're definitely extremely helpful to uh, the really the plight of the customer today. Right, yeah, and I mean, I think hopefully the, you know, that's that's a good thing we're seeing in terms of the sort of corporate citizenship there of um, of those of those large banks. Yes, and I think some banks are handling it better than others, right? Um, not everybody is cut out of the same cloth in terms of being able to handle these kinds of uh, setups. But the banks that have uh, you know uh, innovated or you know put more amount of resources in the past few years in innovating digitally and making sure that they have a solid digital footprint are the ones that are coming ahead in this race. So the pen penultimate question would be around, and I know we have many, um, many, many founders and others in the startup ecosystem uh, listen to the podcast. If you can talk a little bit more around kind of your experience from the, from the kind of founder seat, uh, mm -hmm. tackling some of the challenges and, and perhaps there's some opportunities in there as well with, um, with COVID and maybe just to add a little bit of color in terms of from, from my portfolio. I mean, I think I've, it's been that blend of you know, unfortunately, lots of people having to, you know, there's, there's definitely been layoffs, there's been a number of people reducing uh, compensation across the, um, across the board to whether, you know, to try and avoid those layoffs to, to weather the storm. Mm -hmm. Equally, I've seen uh, certain founders, you know, really spinning up in, in real time, uh, new products and services to help their uh, clients and customers, be they consumers or SMEs or corporates uh, react to COVID and actually kind of adding, you know, helping to add value to the ecosystem is, uh, in, in that respect. So I have seen, um, I have seen both sides and you know, it would be really interesting to hear um, what you can share around how you've, um, how you've tackled the impact. Yes, absolutely. These are very interesting times for every startup, but uh, for us even more so because the amount of impact we're making on our customers before, right now that impact has increased many, many folds, right? Um, so uh, our target set, uh, customer set is, uh, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, was living paycheck to paycheck even before the crisis. Now many of them have lost their paychecks entirely. So what that means is it has increased uh, and really heightened our attention to even accelerate many different kinds of things that we do in our building from a product roadmap perspective. For our existing product, we are increasing the uh, you know amount of um, attention that we are providing to just getting in front of as many customers as possible and increasing the amount of refunds we can provide to them and increasing the types of different negotiations we can provide for customers in this very, very interesting time that the customer themselves is going through. Um, the second thing is um, it has accelerated uh, parts of our roadmap that had always existed but make even more sense now. So for example, 
Um, you know, we uh, have an internal uh, financial health scoring metric and credit worthiness metric that we determine in the negotiation process. But now we are releasing a suite of products uh, to make that, uh, you know, score uh, customer facing, as well as, you know, help lenders triangulate um, and find better forms of, you know, provide better forms of credit to customers, especially when the traditional FICO score cannot provide something like that. So we are uh, creating and introducing new kinds of products to bridge that gap for this really new normal that we are seeing in the financial uh, ecosystem right now. In terms of how the team itself is, um, you know, is operating in these circumstances, um, you know, everybody is remote. Every startup that has the luxury of being remote is doing remote work, and it has, uh, you know, it has been interesting to see how um, how startups and their teams, uh, you know, um, adhere to and adapt to these new circumstances. For us, uh, we're lucky to be able to do all of the things that we do uh, from a remote perspective, and our team has. Uh, been inspired by, you know, once again, the ability to provide that impact to the cu to customers in the in these times. Um, and really, I think uh, that is what makes me uh, want to wake up every morning and just go, go, go. Uh, and I'm very proud of the work that my team is doing because we're really helping customers bring food to the table, pay for emergencies and, you know, bring real dollars back into their account. So it has been a lot of inspirational, uh, you know, acceleration of our product roadmap for us. Um, for uh, for the rest of the ecosystem, I've obviously seen friends uh, who have startups that have benefited uh, in terms of being able to provide more, uh, being more relevant to customers currently. And in many other cases, they have had to do, uh, you know, uh, take very hard decisions and lay off employees. Um, and uh, really reduce their compensation and all of those things. But I think if you are able to be resilient and if you are able to really survive this apocalypse of sort, you emerge out very strong on the other end of it. And uh, I think every startup founder is trying to exercise all of that currently. That's um, it, it's kind of great to hear that that sort of almost that, that kind of positive call to arms there, Nami, in terms of the, you know the and I think it's it's. Certainly, why you know that our investment thesis into, into Harvest remains as, as relevant as ever. Um, you know, helping helping those people that we're really kind of a, a attacking, addressing that pain point makes a ton really? of sense, especially in um in this market. To um, and I think you kind of touched on it there, just in terms of sort of tips and advice for um for other founders and, and entrepreneurs. But maybe to close out the the podcast here, do you have um do you have any other sort of top tips again? You know, from from your experience, from your network. For um for people founders trying to um trying to navigate this this current market and the current situation we're in, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean we're all uh, trying to adapt here, uh, but I think uh, the the main thing is you need to make sure that you are conserving capital as much as you can. You want to make sure that you're alive at the end of this, right? So capital conservation is king at this time. The second thing is, this is really the time to, you know, really strip all of the excesses that you may have been, you know, doing in terms of your expenses, right? This is not the time for glamour, it's the time for discipline. So, you know, uh, really appreciating the benefits of thriftiness and making sure that you are taking a hard look at all of the outflows that are happening uh, in terms of expenses from your bank accounts. You need to really, really look at every single penny and justify whether it makes sense right now to spend. And then I think, uh, you know, beyond capital and, you know, discipline, I think it, the most important thing right now is adaptability, right? Um, this new world post COVID is going to look extremely different in terms of, uh, you know, new behaviors from consumers, new behaviors for businesses, even, you know, new behaviors from enterprises. So there is a lot of opportunity when you look at it that way, uh, you know, for uh, additional innovation that can come out of it. And you can do it, uh, you know, from a focused, perspective because this is not the time for engaging in fundraising or anything like that, especially if you have the option to not do so. This is really the time to make sure that you are 
executing on a product roadmap and you have the ability to really adapt and pivot to new ways of helping your customer regardless of who that customer is whether it's the you know a typical uh, you know um, consumer or even if it's an enterprise there are new ways that we all need to be able to adapt to it. So I would say the biggest thing here is to make sure that you are looking at data and you're really rising above all of your um, all of your own uh, conceptions about uh, hypotheticals about what you had thought this world to be and really understand how this new world is going to look like and just do things to adapt to this new ecosystem. Thanks, Tom. I mean, no, 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 I totally agreed on the, the agility point there, I think is, is absolutely crucial alongside obviously yeah, capital preservation is, um, is going to be absolutely key. Um, so thanks so much for your time, um, your words of wisdom, and, and thanks for coming in. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. And, uh, you know, I really love the, the content that you're producing here. That was Nami Bral, the founder of Harvest. In other news, COVID-19 has impacted all of us in newfound ways. We've shifted our sourcing efforts for the New York programs, including the Female Innovators Lab by Barclays and Anthemus, as well as the Barclays Accelerator, which is powered by Techstars, to a virtual environment. That means the team is conducting informational sessions and applications online. The Accelerator is an intensive 13-week program designed to fast track the next generation of fintech startups by providing unprecedented access to the Barclays and Techstars network and knowledge base. More information can be found on our website, barclaysaccelerator.com. You can sign up for virtual offers to connect with the team and learn more about the upcoming New York program. My team, Principal Investments, also launched a program specifically dedicated to supporting female founders. The Female Innovators Lab by Barclays and Anthemus is a New York-based venture studio with a mission to identify female founders at the earliest stage of their journey, provide them with an initial investment, and match them with the resources and mentorship required to bring a business concept to market. More information can also be found on our website, barclays.com slash female innovators lab. So to wrap up, thanks for tuning in again to this first edition of our Rise podcast from New York City. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe via your favorite app, leave a review, share with colleagues, partners, friends, and we will catch up with you in the next episode. Until then, 